Justin Guest. I'm a professor at the Shar School of Policy and Government at George Mason University. And uh, my work studies immigration and the politics of demographic change. My new book, Majority Minority, is just about to come out. And it's a book about how societies respond to great demographic change. And you know, this question lingers over the contemporary politics of the United States and also other countries where persistent immigration has altered uh, populations and may soon produce this majority minority milestone where one uh, 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 ethnic or, rela or racial group uh, loses its numerical advantage to one or more other minority groups. And I think this is the kind of uh, demographic phenomenon that has been infusing so much of our social politics uh, heretofore and the culture wars and, and nationalism uh, that has characterized politics uh, in recent decades. And I think it's unlikely to go away. Um, and I think that the book challenges us not only to understand demographic change and, and our response to it in, in terms of how to coexist, um, but also challenges us to ask the question of how we can break boundaries, how we can actually prepare ourselves uh, for the demographic change in our future. Why did I write this book? The prospects of demographic change, the specter of a majority minority milestone, uh, I found to just be everywhere. And I found it, it was almost like the sort of turf that we as Americans uh, and to some degree other countries are playing on. It's, it's what the ocean is for fish, what the air is for us, barometric pressure. Demographic change and, and what the future holds um, was inspiring, I thought, so much of our politics, um, whether it's you know with healthcare or the economy or immigration. Um, and so I want to explore you know, how do societies respond to, to enormous demographic change? Um, because the United States, as it turns out, isn't alone. And that was really the sort of crucial moment that said, okay, this can be a book. This can be a, a really important study. Um, because when we think about demographic change in the United States, when we think about the upcoming majority minority milestone, where uh, the original ethnic or religious group loses its numerical advantage to one or more uh, minority groups, that has always been thought of as somehow exceptional, that the US is the first country uh, where this is ever happening. And we are certainly the first big country uh, where this is happening. Um, and uh, it's all the more interesting because we're a democracy because of democracy's majoritarian uh, logic. But we're not the first country, and we're not the first sovereign society. And when I found that there are a number of smaller countries, um, all of which in, in the case of what I study are islands, it was a breakthrough because I saw that we can learn something about the experience of transformative demographic change from other places. And, uh, and, and I was super inspired at that point and, uh, and off I went. What surprised me most um, as I was in the midst of my research and, and, and also, you know, as I was concluding it and reflecting upon everything that I had I had seen, I had calculated, that I had observed. Um, I think what really surprised me most was the power of leadership. So much of, of our politics when it comes to race, ethnicity, religion, identity politics, our culture wars in the United States, uh, but also transatlantically. So much of those politics is uh, focused on individual level attitudes, individual level prejudice. And what consumes us is the extent to which we observe prejudice, that we observe stereotyping, that we observe double standards in our society. And that's not to say that those things aren't real. They're very real. They're structural, really. Um, uh, and it's not to suggest that those things aren't worth addressing, worth calling out, and worth doing something about. But where real change was taking place um, was when leaders defied those attitudes, when leaders took it upon themselves to shape those attitudes. And so, you know, it was that those attitudes are not necessarily determinant of where society goes and how society copes with its diversification. Um, there's an enormous place for leadership and, and not just in leadership in terms of like policymaking um, and, uh, and uh, procedures and, and vision, but also rhetoric. And the power of rhetoric, the power of, of identity and leveraging who you are to mobilize people, to inspire change, uh, comes through in, in each of the different cases that I studied and through the polling uh, research and evidence that I collect. Um, and this is something I think 
um, that we should be thinking about more broadly than just thinking of like the role of a president or a prime minister. This is about leadership in a variety of places. If we are going to confront this enormous social challenge of how to respond to demographic change in a peaceful, coexisting kind of way, then you don't need just one leader. You need the, to leverage the power of a million leaders. So that means the leader of companies, the leader of civil society organizations and associations, local and municipal leaders, um, small businesses, you know, those are all leaders too, because they have the power to model the changes that we need to see in our society. And I think that was probably the most surprising element. I think that the first thing to recognize is that remarkably and very counterintuitively, this isn't actually the first majority mi minority milestone that the United States has experienced. So we, you know, treat this as a very historic moment, but it really does depend on how you construe the American majority. So in the 1800s and really prior to the 20th century, whiteness in the United States, because whiteness is embodies the U.S. majority these days. Whiteness also embodied the majority in those days. But what it meant to be white was different. So in those days, whiteness really referred to a sort of Northern European Protestant uh, identity, um, obviously grounded in sort of the Anglo heritage of the country. But don't forget, there are lots of Dutch people and, and others. Um, and through the sort of spectacles, through the lens of the 19th century, um, the Greeks, the Jews, the Slavs, the Irish, the Germans, um, the Catholic groups like Italians who came into the United States towards the turn of the 20th century and, and, and thereafter, um, were not considered part of mainstream American whiteness. And they were considered white ethnics. And the real challenge in those days was not that different from the one we face today. How do we coexist with all these different people here? What has changed, of course, is that we no longer in the United States think of someone who is of Greek heritage or Italian heritage or Irish heritage as too different or somehow separate from the white mainstream. Quite the opposite, actually, we con con you know, conventionally think of them as white as well. Um, but that just wasn't true before. So if we take that 19th century understanding of whiteness, we've been a majority minority society for years. You know, this is not, you know, anything new. What changed? was how we understand who the American identity is, who we are, that changing definition of we. And once we understand the subjectivity of whiteness, the subjectivity of what it means to be an American, we realize two things. One is that the milestone, the majority minority milestone uh, is uh, provoked a lot of white ethnics as they were called at the time, to trade in their marginality, their minority status, to join the dominant white group um, in exchange for the continued subjugation of people of color. By joining whiteness, the Greeks, Slavs, Italians of those days um, actually perpetuated the subordinacy in American society of people of black heritage, of, of Asian or what they called Asiatic heritage in those days, and eventually Latinos as well. So that was a trade-off. The other thing that it tells us, though, is that the majority-minority milestone is completely constructed. We are inventing what it means to be a nation. We invent what it means to be a majority. And that means that our understanding of who we are is somehow flexible, and it evolves. And there, you know, we come back to the power of leadership, because leaders... Uh, symbolize, right? They they model how we understand who we are. They define who we are uh, in very powerful ways. And so, you know, I think that the best way of complicating discourse and the media's treatment of this majority minority milestone is to recognize that history and to recognize that whiteness and what it means to be American may even change again. And that actually the real problem is the maintenance of these pesky racial and ethnic and religious barriers in our society, that we even associate Americanness or the American identity with whiteness at all. What we really want to aim for and strive for is a more civic understanding of who we are, such that the racial and ethnic boundaries become obsolete.
how we learn to accept differences and how we learn to coexist with each other um, really comes down to contact, to intergroup relations. And there are very strong forces right now that are pushing us into silos of people who are like us. Now, whether they're like us racially, ethnically, religiously, professionally, in terms of age cohorts, gender, subcultural elements and lifestyle, sexuality, um, it, it all is true, right? Uh, various um, innovations in communications and technology reinforce the boundaries between us because they allow us to connect across these senses of, of, of commonality in really powerful ways that, by the way, are not really reversible. So we're just going to have to learn to, to live with them, um, even if you want to lament them. Um, but breaking those silos and, and transgressing those boundaries is really how we overcome um, the, the ossification of those boundaries, right? We, we can break down the rigidity only by actually interacting with people across them. And unfortunately, it's not just these communications and technological factors that are keeping us apart. We are physically apart from each other. So residential segregation is still real, not just actually from a racial or ethnic perspective, but actually from a partisan perspective. In the United States right now, Democrats are not living very close to Republicans, uh, according to a new study that came out in, in Nature. And this is a really powerful trend um, because it actually demonstrates the way our politics are also becoming racialized and segregated in the way that our social relations uh, previously were. So I, I think that we need to find ways to facilitate bridge building. And that comes down to how we design uh, our businesses, our, our associations, our government, our um, public goods. Uh, and I think we need to actually begin the process of getting in touch with each other because that's where really progress is made. Listening, sharing of stories, uh, and getting to better understand the other, whatever you know, social boundary that needs to be crossed. Well, in many ways, this is the you know, trillion dollar question, right? How do we reimagine who we are to be truly inclusive? And to be truly inclusive, it means that we have to thread a very narrow needle. We have to be both inclusive enough to include everyone broadly, but exclusive enough so that the identity is something that is compelling, that is distinguished. What is an identity if everyone shares it? It's not actually identifying. So there has to be some degree of exclusivity there. Um, and so you need the sort of minimal amount of exclusivity necessary to create distinction. And you want to maximize inclusion within that. And that's a, a really tough needle to thread. Put another way, um, as I write in the book, and, and, and as you're alluding to, how do we honor, honor heritage on the one hand and, and revere those backgrounds so that people feel included um, without reproducing historic inequalities? And I think this comes down to really pulling the best of where we come from um, and identifying a common purpose about where we go. And, you know, this is obviously easier said than done, but it's a matter of remembering that our goal has to be uh, inclusion, ultimately. And we need people to feel a sense of belonging. And what's so challenging about this is that everything that we've been learned about inclusion here heretofore has been about the inclusion of minority groups. But what we're also witnessing is enormous backlash from white majorities in many European and North American countries who feel excluded from the sense of inclusion or feel like those kinds of programs are somehow off balance uh, or excuse me, off limits to them. And this is where the sort of, you know, radical inclusion comes in. How do we make everyone feel invested? How do we make everyone feel a sense of belonging? Um, because right now, unfortunately, the debate is really unproductive. It's often about who's had it worse, you know, whose vulnerabilities matter more. And that is a debate where there is never going to be a winner. And people just talk past each other. It's really about how do we identify across a common struggle uh, and how do we see each other uh, in one another's dreams? And I think that that is how we can actually pursue and thread that needle. Uh, it, is, it is when we can actually um, have full inclusion and belonging in mind uh, while recognizing the power of identifying distinction um, to the extent that that's possible.
at the most individual level, and uh, and I'll talk about the individual level, and then we'll get into some examples. Um, but at the most individual level, it is to question yourself uh, about who you're ignoring, who are you not hearing from, whose stories do you not fully understand? Um, because I think we make a lot of prejudgments about people who we see as oppositional, uh, people who we see as foreign, people who we see as too different from us. And I think those are precisely the people who we actually should be interacting with more uh, to learn their stories and to and to see uh, the commonalities that we share. Um, and so I think trying to diversify uh, not just you know who we have lunch with on, on a daily basis, uh, who we have conversations with, but you know where we shop, what we read. Um, to diversify that is a really important way to understand where the other perspective is coming from. Um, on, on a more programmatic level, um, there's some really interesting examples of how this is taking place, how people are threading the needle of honoring history uh, while also uh, broadening um, a, a sense of identity. Um, the best example and the most inspiring one for me uh, is this group in West Virginia. And it's actually a political uh, group, uh, an initiative that's called West Virginia Can't Wait. Um, and they're quite progressive in their politics, but you wouldn't know it at least prima facie because the way they identify is as rednecks. And that's actually the word that they use. And of course, rednecks has really become a, a derogatory term in American society. And it's one that has led to a lot of uh, resentment uh, among white working class people who feel like they're being prejudged on the basis of their whiteness and on the basis of poverty or low educational attainment. But actually what this group has found uh, through historical research and, and just you know, um, building bridges inside of West Virginia is that the word redneck originates uh, from an incredibly honorable origin. So during the mining wars of the early 20th century around 1919, 1920, when uh, non-unionized, non-affiliated miners uh, were, took up arms to protest um, the terrible work conditions in West Virginia mines, uh, and actually were, were attacked by the federal government in support of the mining companies. Uh, they were in battle. They were engaged in literally like gun shooting, you know, battle with the federal government and the security guards, uh, of the, uh, of the mines. And so during these battles, uh, they needed a way to identify their, you know, brethren. And the way they did it is they tied red handkerchiefs around their necks to identify each other. They didn't have uniforms. They weren't an army. They, they, this was not an organized group. And that red handkerchief uh, became known as, as being a redneck. And the rednecks were actually incredibly diverse group of people. Uh, not only were they a variety of white ethnic groups, uh, many of whom were of immigrant origin because that's who was actually manning the mines, but they were also had a number of African-Americans uh, and they were incredibly diverse regionally and geographically inside the United States. And so here you had this multi-ethnic group that was standing up for their, for their rights as workers. Um, and the idea of being a redneck has somehow, you know, been um, stigmatized in the years since. And so here we have a proud tradition of, um, of American heritage that is often associated with poor white folks in these days in a very derogatory manner that they're reclaiming and that they're in, they, they're laying, uh, inspire a progressive approach um, to, uh, uh, to labor and, and, to, uh, and to social politics in West Virginia. And it's just such an inspiring approach that both is inclusive on the one hand, um, but also and honors heritage, um, but actually is also quite exclusive. It's a unique identity uh, to this group of people. And many West Virginians have already identified themselves kind of proudly reclaiming a, a stigmatized identity as rednecks. And, uh, and I think that's the, the way forward. Examples like that are how we can do this. The impact that this book has had on me as an author um, is that I really find the challenge of unifying uh, multi-ethnic, diversifying societies um, to be incredibly daunting. And I think I appreciate the scale uh, of the challenge before us. But I also now appreciate um, the, the weight of it and how important it is. Uh, I, I think that how we uh, decide to coexist, the actions we take to coexist as a society 
uh, in the face of enormous demographic change um, is the greatest social challenge facing our country and other diversifying countries uh, for the next generation or two. Uh, it will define who we are as a people, our strength as a country, uh, our ability to pass policies and not be paralyzed uh, leg legislatively. Um, and it will affect the, 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 the nature of our intergroup relationships. And so I have, um, I think I, I have newfound respect for the gravity of this problem. It is even bigger than I ever thought it might, might be when I first started writing the book. Um, I also have a lot of respect now um, for the power of nationalism. Uh, nationalism uh, heretofore has always been thought of something uh, quite vile, actually, quite exclusive, restrictive, um, is a way of alienating people. Um, and that's largely true. Nationalism is usually not reared in a very nice way, uh, politically and socially. Um, and yet, what I find is that there's almost an inherent human need for nationalism. Uh, people want to be proud of the country that they come from. They want to maintain a certain veneer of distinction in a world where our borders are being blurred by the phenomena, by global phenomena like commerce and trade, climate change and migration. All of those things blur the boundaries between us as countries. And there is yet this backlash, uh, a nationalist backlash, because actually there's a value to distinctions. Um, at least uh, in the minds of many, uh, many human beings. And so I think the question for us when it comes to nationalism, and if we are to confront this incredible social challenge uh, in all of its gravity, is how to actually live with nationalism and wield it in a way that produces progress, that produces new forms of solidarity, that opens the nation to a country in all of its diversity and recognizes the evolving nature of who, it, who are we. Who is the people?